I'm Debbie Moran. I am the novice chair for Houston Astronomical Society, and I've been a member since 1980. And I've learned just about everything I know about observing from the Astronomical Society. But before joining, I spent quite a bit of time just learning the naked eye sky and some constellations, which is the way I recommend that anyone who's completely new to astronomy start. So tonight, we're just going to do a tour of the winter sky. And we're going to add another element, which is how to stay comfortable when you're winter observing. It's cold and you're not moving around much. And let me go ahead and share my screen here um, for you Game of Thrones fans. Uh, winter comes for a very long time on that planet, many years. Um, and it comes every year here, but uh, this is Houston, so we have it for maybe about the next two weeks if you're new to Houston. <laughs> um, it, but however, it's very cold and in Houston, it's unusually cold um, even when the temperatures are not that bad because of our humidity. So I was amazed to see that I was more comfortable in 20 degrees in Denver when I was visiting my brother than 40 degrees here. So we still need to definitely dress for the weather. We're going to have lows in the 40s the next few uh, nights. So um, you don't want to get too cold. The problem with astronomy is you're not, uh, you're not moving around very much. So I recommend overdressing for the weather by about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Joe, I'm seeing a lot of my controls at the top. Is that interfering with your view? Uh, no, we don't see them okay. at all. You can see the whole slide. Okay, Absolutely. Okay. Um, so what I do recommend is layers. So you want to start out with long underwear, which growing up in Texas, I never really had until I started doing some hiking in Alaska. And that's when I discovered long underwear. And it makes an enormous difference. There's also models for women. Um, so no matter, even if it starts out a little bit warmer, if I'm expecting a cold night, I start out with long underwear, both uh, bottoms and tops. And, uh, and then maybe lighter layers to start out with until moving into the, dark, the colder parts of the evening. And one thing I discovered is that if your legs aren't warm, you're not warm. So there's all sorts of uh, either underneath your jeans or on top, uh, uh, want something like fleece is great or down. And then I recommend an outer layer such as rain pants, something that blocks wind and water will make it make you much more comfortable. Um, there's also convertible gloves. So a lot of people like uh, gloves that you can go fingerless if you have to for handling an eyepiece, but then covers your fingers. So this set actually has a uh, fingerless and then um, sort of a mitt that <laughs> goes over it. Um, there is something like this. I, um, I didn't bring it in, but I have a very thick ski glove that has a little zipper on the side of it, and you can kind of slide out your fingers, which is great for a very cold night. Um, also, I haven't tried this yet, but a lot of astronomers swear by hand warmers, foot warmers, and you can even do body warmers. So you, you uh, apparently break these, and you can have a few hours of heat against your body, and I've heard people say that that's extremely effective. So in general, you want to dress maybe um, colder than you would if you were moving around. So I, I think about 20 degrees colder. So if it's 40, I'm not comfortable until I dress for 20. And, and the other thing is you want to keep your feet both warm and dry. So hiking boots can be good if they're a Gore-Tex. Um, you want wool socks rather than cotton. If they get wet or, or from sweat, they'll be warm while wet. Um, next, we want, now that we've got ourselves warm, we want to learn the constellations. So there is a children's book, which I recommend for adults also, called Find the Constellations, or The Stars is a thicker book, which includes Find the Constellations and a lot more basic information about astronomy. And this is the same author, H.A. Ray, who wrote the Curious George children's books. Even though these are written for children, they're super clear. The dot to dots he draws of the, of the constellations are very easy to remember. I think I use almost all of them. The ones I learned when I was 12 years old are still the shapes I see in the sky now, except for maybe Leo and Taurus. I prefer the map we're gonna to use tonight for those two. There's also some other great um, basic beginning books. Um, almost anything by Terence Dickinson is great. There's about four or five choices on Amazon and a good uh, basic sky atlas. Um, when you choose a sky atlas, there are different degrees of how deep into the sky they go. So either larger pieces of the sky with uh, stars that are maybe only naked eye magnitude, or if you're using a telescope, 
you need an atlas, which may be a smaller piece of the sky and lets you see the, kind, the deeper magnitude or the fainter stars that might appear in your telescope. But to start out with, when you're just learning the sky or using a small telescope, uh, something like the Pocket Sky Atlas is great, or I don't have a picture of it, Norton's Sky Atlas is also excellent. Um, for just learning the sky itself, you want either a planisphere, uh, which I didn't bring tonight, but there's a monthly map on the uh, website, www.skymaps.com, which um, will allow you to learn a lot about the night sky early in the evening. So you will notice at the upper right, it tells you what times of night it's good for, for that month. Um, it's only for e early evening, because as you're observing, the sky is rotating, stars are setting in the west, uh, stars are rising in the east. They'll work reasonably well for the first one or two hours of the evening. And the times you'll notice as you go through the year are adjusted for daylight saving time. So these times will be a lot later in the summer. So they are basically cover um, soon after dark for whatever month it is. It's a great map in that it also includes a lot of information. So on the left side, it tells you some very interesting naked eye things that happen all, all month long. And on the back, or a second page that you can print out, it goes into detail about all the objects. So a lot of the objects you can see in a small telescope are marked on the map as little, um, little smudges with numbers by them. These are the Messier objects, most of them. These are all objects that you can see in a small telescope or with binoculars. Now, when I learned the sky, I like to start out with very familiar constellations, very easy to see constellations and branch out. And I also like to divide the sky into regions. So tonight we're gonna to discuss first the stars around Orion. So here's Orion the hunter. He looks like a hunter. He's got a club and a shield um, and the famous belt, which everyone recommend, recognizes from every culture, although they may have a different uh, meaning or picture for that belt. And um, once you find a familiar constellation, you can start branching out. You'll go around the constellation and uh, use it as sort of a reference point to find more. So we'll start out with this area. Then we're going to talk about the circumpolar stars. And I'll tell you why I'm doing that order later on. So those are the stars that, ne that uh, never, ri never rise or set. They are so close to the North Star, Polaris here. That, uh, that when they get as low as they get, they're still above the horizon. And then we have an entire story in this part of the sky from Greek mythology. The other thing you need to know about any star map is you notice that west is on the right here, east is on the left. If you were to take this, um, north is at the top, south is at the bottom. If you were to take this map, hold it over your head and put north facing north, and all of a sudden everything's correct. East will be on the right side as it should be. So. Um, the directions are reversed compared to what you're used to because you're looking at a map of something that's over your head instead of below you. So when you use this map, you need to know that the stars in the middle are directly overhead and you only use part of it at a, at a time. So you'll take the direction that you see and notice that they're all topsy-turvy. You want to face that compass direction, put that direction at the bottom, and then all of the stars, say we're facing south, all the stars in this region of the map up till about the right, about the zenith, which we call overhead, are going to be right side up for you. Um, so that's very, very important. If you try to use the map, uh, uh, say upside down for the constellations you're facing, they're going to look upside down to you. So we're going to start with Orion. Here's just kind of a rough diagram. Uh, but it shows the constellations we're going to discuss. So we have Orion the Hunter, very easy to find because of this very three bright stars in a very straight line. Um, two shoulders, uh, Betel, the star Betelgeuse and the star, um, star Bellatrix. And two feet, the most brightest one is Rigel over here, which actually means foot in Arabic. So the names of the stars tend to be in Arabic language and the constellations are based on on uh, Greek mythology. So Orion's a great signpost, which we'll go into more detail later, but his belt points upward toward Taurus the bull and downward toward, uh, toward Canis Major. This is the dog star here. And then he has two major constellations over his shoulders. You've got Auriga up here, the charioteer, and over his left shoulder, you've got Gemini, the twins. 
So again, we can use Orion as a signpost to find other, um, other constellations. The belt points one direction toward uh, the brightest star in Taurus, the other direction toward the brightest star in Canis Major, which is Sirius. And um, then we can, we can use other parts of the constellation to point toward other, other um, constellations. So map of Orion, um, probably the first thing people look at when they get a new telescope, if they're observing in the winter, is uh, the Orion Nebula. And um, that's found actually in a small, small group of stars here, which are more like a dagger or sword. A lot of people talk about being in the belt. No, the belt's over here. Um, the Orion Nebula is in between these stars and the dagger. And this can be seen actually as a fuzzy spot, even in binoculars. The other reason I like this slide is Orion is a great way to see star colors. So normally you just look up, all the stars look white to you, but you will notice color contrasts of two stars are prominent and close to each other. So if you look at Orion, you'll see a very definite ruddy color to Betelgeuse, which is a red giant star, and a very definite blue color to Rigel, which is a blue giant. So this star is very young and hot. It's, it's um, large because it's uh, made out of a lot of material and it's burning very fast and hot. So that contributes to its blue color, which is the hottest color for stars. This is also a giant star, but for a different reason. It might have started out closer to the sun's size and it's now toward the end of its life. It's burned all of its hydrogen. Um, it's <clears throat> refused all of its hydrogen, I should say, in the center and it's starting to use fuel in its outer layers. That's heating up the outer layers and they're expanding at this point. Um, if we were, if Betelgeuse were where the sun was, that would be, go, be going beyond uh, the, the orbit of Mars. So if and when, actually it's so when the sun goes, becomes a red giant, which will happen later in its life, uh, the earth will be inside it. Not a bad reason to be starting and working on, on space travel now. So this is the Hubble view of the Orion. This is not what you're gonna see in your small telescope, but it does tell you what it is. It's an area of star formation. So all of this gas is, uh, we call it H2 regions. This is uh, hydrogen for the most part. And inside all of this gas, you have brand new stars. So this is a stellar nursery. It's where new stars are being born and created. Um, here is an image uh, by Don Selly, taken a few years ago, I believe now. Um, but again, this is not what you're going to see in your telescope. It's what you can image in your telescope. Um, this is a very um, kind of a, a low exposure, just 30 seconds in a small telescope. And I like this one because it shows you four of the brightest stars which are forming, the trapezium, which is named for its trapezoid shape. And you begin to see some nebulosity, but this is still not what you see when you look through a telescope. So today I finally found a sketch which comes close, looks more like this. Um, what's missing is the sense of a flashlight being behind this. It's even more beautiful than this. So the Ryan Nebula is gonna look in your telescope, small telescope, a lot like curling cigarette smoke with a flashlight behind it. It's very beautiful. <clears throat> Again, here is the trapezium, which you will notice is four bright stars, is the brightest stars in the middle of the nebula in your telescope. <clears throat> so I also wanted to add that this is something you're not going to be able to see easily in a small telescope, but um, these are very recent images by Rob Brayton. And just to show you the degree of, um, of uh, technology and skill we now have in astroimaging to take absolutely stunning photos. So this is near one of the belt stars in Orion, the Horsehead Nebula. I have seen it in a small telescope. It's very small, but it's named for the, this dusty area, which is, uh, which is blocking out the lit up uh, hydrogen behind it. He also just took a new photo or a new image of, of images because it's not photographic. They're using um, uh, different kind of technology to image of the rosette. And just today in my uh, research, I found out that the rosette nebula became the official state nebula of Oklahoma in April 2019. 2000, so 2019. Um, once you've found Orion, uh, the next constellation you go to is, uh, is Taurus the Bull. And um, so 
let's see if I can see. Oh, okay, there's my mouse. So towards the bowl, you'll find if you go upward um, in our sky anyway, from Orion's belt, you're gonna run into a very bright star called Aldebaran, which is another red giant. It's gonna appear red. And once you find that, you'll notice it's part of a V shape, which is very prominent, just these five stars. If you take your binoculars and look at it, you'll see there's a lot more stars in there because this is the closest open, what we call an open cluster or star cluster to us. So these are stars that all formed from the same cloud of gas, except for Aldebaran, which is a foreground star. And, um, and so you, typically those are maybe 120 stars, 80 to 120. And um, by the time you see them as a cluster, the hydrogen gas has been all used up. You no longer see the nebulosity. Um, if you continue onward, we're gonna run into the Pleiades, which has a little bit of nebulosity in it, which imagers can catch, but you probably won't see it in your telescope either. These two are the closest star clusters to us that we can see naked eye. Um, we also have one more tonight that we can see naked eye, but um, there are plenty of star clusters which we'll discuss later, which you can see in your telescope or binoculars also. So if looking closer at the Hyades, which is this V-shape, um, what you'll probably notice most prominently if you look, when you look in binoculars is that this star is not one, but two. And actually it's gonna turn out to be a part of what we call the triple double. I think I have another slide for that. Um, and uh, what you will see in your telescope, the wonder, delightful thing to do in your small telescope is to put each pair of stars, which are at the vertex of a triangle, these two, these two, and these two, at the edges of your field, and it makes a wonderful grouping. There are some other what we call asterisms um, that are just shapes of stars. They're not constellations, but make interesting shapes within this, which I've actually never looked at. Um, but you can see these in binoculars. And here's a closer up look of uh, the triple double. So you would have uh, this, this pair, this pair, and this pair which naked eye, you just see a single star here. So again, here's, this shows the relationship, Orion's belt to Aldebaran, the Hyades, which is this V shape. Um, notice that the sides of the V point to two other prominent stars. There's this one, and there's this one, which is actually part of a different constellation. It's part of Arega charioteer, um, but it makes a shape of a head of a bull. And then if you continue further, again, we have the Pleiades, which some people think of as a shoulder of the bull. So here's the Pleiades close up. Here's the nebulosity. The hydrogen gas is not completely incorporated in stars yet. Um, but in a smaller telescope, in binoculars, it looks like this. Uh, in a small telescope, it's actually a little too big to fit completely in your field. You need a very low power, wide field eyepiece to see all of it. And the Pleiades is, um, is uh, also a star cluster um, and also naked eye. And some people think it was the seven sisters or, or seven nymphs out of Greek mythology. Um, oh, one other thing I should mention is that the Pleiades is also considered a test of your eyesight. Um, some people can see seven, most, people, most of us can see six. It looks like a little tiny dipper, but the number of Pleiades you can see naked eye is a test of how good your eyesight is or how good the night is. Um, near one of the horns, um, actually it's a horn that's not part of Auriga, it's the Crab Nebula. And on the right, we see what it looks like in a small telescope. On the left, we kind of get the very large imaging view or the Hubble view. So this is a different kind of nebula. It is a star that was at the tail end of its life and exploded in 1054 AD. Um, we think uh, that the next star that might do this in our galaxy is Eta Carina. Some people think maybe, maybe Betelgeuse and, and Orion. Um, when this thing went off, um, it was a supernova explosion. Uh, it could be seen naked eye during the daytime. It is now fading. And you can actually see, I don't think I brought a slide of that, but you can actually see over the years that this explosion is becoming bigger and bigger. There are some people who image that and can see the difference over a number of years. Um, the other thing to, to note is that the, what creates a supernova is a very, very large star, something more like Rigel, which is so large that it's burning blue hot and only lives millions of years. Those stars are so massive 
that instead of uh, condensing into what we call a planetary nebula and a, and a white dwarf, they are large enough to create the heavier elements. Once they start fusing the heavier elements into iron, that starts to consume energy instead of creating it, and the star collapses catastrophically in a very short time and then explodes. And in the middle is a, what we call a neutron star is left, where there's no space in the atoms anymore. The electrons that circle the protons or orbit are, have now been crunched into those, um, into those protons, so there's only neutrons remaining. This means a very, very large star could end up uh, the size of, of a piece of the Earth. So it, it's an incredible condensation of what's left of the star. Um, Arica Charioteer is another prominent constellation. Uh, its brightest star is called Capella. It's located over Orion's right shoulder and head. And um, it's kind of a very basic uh, pentagon shape. Uh, so H.A. Ray sees it as a large head with a sort of paper, a paper triangle hat. He sees this as a nose and this is a neck down here. I still see that shape every time I look at Auriga the charioteer. The, the things that are interesting to look at in binoculars or a telescope are three open clusters. Again, this is the same kind of thing as the Hyades and the Pleiades, but now you need binoculars to see them as small smudges. And in binoculars, you can see all three of these at once. And they're all very beautiful in a telescope. So um, here's, the, here's all three of them. Over here, here's some M37. They're in an odd order, M37, M36, and M38. M stands for the name Charles Messier, who was a French uh, astronomer in the 1700s who was cataloging any fuzzy object he could find because he was looking for comets. And he wanted to, it, while he was doing that, he found all sorts of other objects and wrote them down, they, especially the ones that turned out not to be comets. And those are some of the best things to start with with the new telescope. So this is my favorite, which is M37, because it's very delicate and lacy looking. Um, a lot of star clusters are a little bit more sparse and brighter, but this creates a very kind of delicate, um, de very delicate appearance in a small telescope. So at this point, we're getting a lot farther away than the Hyades and the Pleiades. We need a telescope to see it. Um, this one has about 500 stars, which may be why it looks so lacy. And it's uh, thousands of light years away instead of just a hundred or so. Now the other next constellation that's interesting to see is Gemini. And it's most noticeable for the two brightest stars over Orion's left shoulder. So you find Betelgeuse and look what appears to be over his shoulder and run into these two stars, which are Pollux and Castor, which are the twins on the Argo knot, on the Argo from a Greek mythology. And um, so those are the brightest stars. And then once you find those, you'll notice kind of stick figure bodies going back toward Orion. So here it is again, um, some of the interesting objects, probably the first thing to look at is another open cluster called M35, which you can look in the foot area of Gemini. And this is what that looks like. It's a little bit more uh, sparse. Oh, sorry, this, I, I forgot to hide that slide. We're not to have any comments this year there. But there's a number of things to see in Gemini, um, especially, uh, which I will show you a couple of them, but uh, a couple of, uh, of clusters, but wonderfully striking in a dark sky with a little bit bigger telescope is NGC 2392, known as Escobo Nebula because of the parka look. And I just heard there's actually getting, this is starting to becoming, become a in, politically incorrect name. So I don't know if we'll have to rename it, but the idea was it's supposed to be someone in the North wearing a parka. So this is a planetary nebula. That means a star, that became a red giant at one point, ran out of fuel, and eventually um, the center of it condensed into a white dwarf, um, which, uh, which is not as dense as a neutron star. And then the outs outer parts of it exploded outward. So you get this uh, white dwarf in the middle and different sort of patterns of explosions. Many of them are double lobed, so they have sort of a butterfly shape, or we may be looking at some of them end on. Now, I did find just today on uh, the Facebook page, Backyard Astronomers, this beautiful montage of everything we've discussed so far. 
So this is taken Croatia by a woman, Ira Sanja. Um, and she said it was literally a, about a minute before an earthquake. But uh, you have Orion's belt here, uh, the sword here. So the, the Orion Nebula is right in here. And uh, his two shoulders are a little bit hidden. And, and here's Rigel down here, feet. You can take, again, the belt and go upward to Aldebaran, the bright star here, which will look a little red, naked eye. Here's the V shape, which is towards the bull's head. Now follow each side of the V to horn number one, the M1, the Crab Nebula, which we discussed is right by that horn, just inside it. And then we can take the other side of the V and we end up at the other horn, which is actually a piece of a, of a Riga the Charioteer. So here's the head, here's the neck, here's um, Capella, the brightest star, which is also kind of an orange red. And then here's the nose that H.A. Uh, Ray draws. And then again, going back to the belt to uh, Taurus, here's the Pleiades right here. Um, and then we see over here, Pollux and Castor rising again over Orion's left shoulder. So over the right shoulders, Auriga, left shoulders, Gemini, follow the belts up to Taurus and the Pleiades. Now, we, in that picture, Orion's not high enough yet, but we will see pretty soon um, below the belt. So going back toward the horizon, if you follow Orion's belt, we come to another prominent constellation. He has two hunting dogs. So the, the big dog, Canis Major, is down here. Sirius is like a very, is the brightest star in the sky, not because it's especially big, but because it's quite close to us, something like eight light years away. And um, it appears very bright and white. And uh, it appears right at the point that you would expect a dog tag on a collar to be on the, on the head. So you have a definite dog-shaped head. You will have a front foot. Um, and then you have a triangle back here, which you will see if it's not very dark, um, the back legs and the tail. And then near the heart, which we'll discuss, there's a wonderful uh, open cluster over there. Now there's one other dog, which only is two stars, Canis Minor. Um, but this star, one of those stars, Procyon, is very, very bright. So Orion is actually surrounded by a number of constellations, each of which has a very bright star in it. One last one I'll mention is Lepus the Hare. This is a faint uh, grouping of stars, but if you see anything under Orion's feet, uh, that's a hare. So you have to, all of this is part of this hunting image. He's, he's fighting towards the bull. He's got two hunting dogs. He's got a, a, a hare under his feet. So here's a closer look at Canis Major, the big dog. Um, here again is Sirius, right where a dog tag should be. And uh, if you look at just one thing, you would look at M41. So you, you go, I, I, what I, the way I find is I see one, and then sometimes I see the star, sort of one, two, three, four stars about equally spaced. And I sort of form a little triangle here. I just go inside his body a bit and find M41. Now, all of these are bright enough that if you have binoculars or you just sweep over it with a telescope that uh, finder that magnifies, you're going to see it as a fuzzy spot. There are other telescope finders that are just targets on the sky. In that case, you need to recognize the shapes of the constellations. And I, I'm always making triangles with stars I can see. So I look at the shape of a triangle, say between these stars or those stars. Sometimes I do two triangles and cross-reference them. Then I put my target over that area and use a wide field eyepiece, and it should be in there somewhere. So here is... Um, uh, M41 over here is cataloged by Charles Messier in 1765. And a lot of these, uh, these telescopic open clusters are, you can see are thousands of light in the two to 4,000 light year range. And then here's another, um, another cluster, which I've actually never looked at. It might be time this year to look at it that was closer to uh, Canis Major's tail. Now, we're going to move to another part of the sky where there's a whole story in the sky. And uh, here are the basic constellations in that story. Actually, I meant to put this a little bit later. Let me go to this slide first. So let me show you where this part of the story is. Um, so we have, I'm going to go back now. So the, the principal players are, we've got Andromeda, who's the princess. We've got um, Cepheus, who's the king of Ethiopia, who's a circumpolar uh, constellation. We've got Cassiopeia, uh, the queen of Ethiopia. 
We've got Perseus the hero. We've got um, uh, Pegasus, the flying horse, which some versions of the story have Perseus using, not all of them. And um, we've got an ocean setting. So we've got Cetus the sea monster or sea beast, which looks a lot like a whale and, and, it's, and it's dot to dot. Um, and that was the sea monster that threatened Andromeda when she was bound to a rock in the ocean. And since it's an ocean setting, we have Pisces. And uh, actually, if far, a little bit away from it, we have uh, uh, Aquarius, the water carrier, too. So here they are in the sky. Uh, the great square Pegasus, this is this um, four stars here, is very easy to see. So it's going to be high in the west. And it's very easy to see because in, these four stars are relatively bright and the interior is relatively empty. Once you've found the great square of Pegasus and you found Cassiopeia, which is a W or M shape, also very easy to see high in the sky, I take the corner of, uh, of the great square and I go in the direction of underneath the W and you will see two, six, sorry, three pairs of two stars. So here, here, and here. That looks like two curved branches of water flowing out of, a, of, out of a box that has a hole in it. Those um, stars are the constellation Andromeda. And uh, if you take the, go from the first pair of stars to the second pair and go about that same distance up toward Cassiopeia, you'll see the Andromeda galaxy. And we'll discuss that in a minute, but this is the farthest away you can see with your naked eye. Um, other players are Cetus, again. Here it's looking much more like a whale. Uh, Pisces, which are like two fish on, on lines here. And um, Aquarius is down here, just uh, in the water area of the, of the map. So one thing to mention at this point is that the ecliptic is the line of sight, our, our solar system's on a plane, and it's the line of sight um, that we would see all the planets and the sun. Um, it's tilted to our equator because of Earth's axis is tilted, but this is the only place the planets and the sun can appear in the sky. Obviously, we can't see the constellations that the sun is there, but these are where the sun would travel throughout the year uh, to, our, to our eye. And all of the constellations along here are zodiac constellations. So you've got Cancer, um, Gemini, Taurus, Pisces, and Aquarius are up in the sky now. So one part of the myth is that um, uh, we have, let me go back actually, I want to also mention the circumpolar stars. Um, we have uh, the Big Dipper, which is part of the Great Bear, which is very easy to see, but not if it's behind a house or a tree, which it might be this time of year. If you do find the Big Dipper, you've, it is the best pointer to the North Star. So you take, you see it as a pot on a stove and you take the bottom of the pot to the top of the front of the pot and continue. And the only bright star you're gonna to come to about uh, four lengths of that is Polaris, the uh, North Star. Now that is a, the end of the Dipper Ursa Minor, the Little Dipper, and that's a much fainter constellation. So in Houston, you may only see the North Star. If you have a little bit darker star, sky, you may start to see the, part of the, the front part of the Dipper. It looks more like a ladle, the way the handle is attached. And as it gets darker in a very dark sky, you start to see the rest of it. Um, if you are in a part of the year, like now, where the Big Dipper is very low, um, almost exactly opposite the same distance as Cassiopeia, which is a very easy to see constellation, as an M or a W, depending on how it's uh, circled around. And the open part of Cassiopeia, again, the only bright star you'll see, again, about the same distance is Polaris. Uh, so it's fairly easy to find Polaris, the North Star, either from the Big Dipper or from Cassiopeia. Now the significance of finding Polaris is if you're facing it, you're facing north, and the stars will all appear to circle Polaris. So they will all rise in the east and set in the west. And uh, as you get farther away from Polaris, they actually rise above the horizon and set. If you're very close to Polaris, they start, they just circle around. Now, this is why I waited to do the circumpolar stars is because Cassiopeia, which is one of the circumpolar, I should say, constellations, is part of this story. So um, Cassiopeia, like the Big Dipper, circles around the North Star. Um, so again, it can be a pointer to the North Star this way. Um, but that's part of the myth. So Cassiopeia um, was a, a mortal queen, and she bragged that she was prettier than all the nymphs. So she was punished later after she died and 
her throne was put into the sky. This is her throne here. And the idea was she was put very close to Polaris so that half of the evening she'd have to hang upside down. So here's uh, Cassiopeia in the sky. Um, she's next to a, a faint constellation called Cepheus, which is the king of Ethiopia. Um, and uh, he looks like a faint house shape. If you're in a very dark sky, like in West Texas, you will easily see Cepheus. In Houston, you won't see him at all. Um, one of my favorite things to look at in Cassiopeia is not one of the main stars, but if you take the left side of the W and come to the next star, you can see naked eye. Um, it's, uh, a, there will be a whole star cluster there. So this is that naked eye star. This is the, um, the star cluster Phi Cassiopeia, um, named for the brightest star, which is Phi or Phi. And uh, they're, la they're uh, labeled in Greek letters according to brightness, order of brightness in the constellation. And um, before the movie E.T. came along, it was known as the owl cluster because it was seen as an owl with two bright eyes sitting on a branch. Um, after the movie, people saw the figure E.T., the extraterrestrial, because it's, it is um, proportioned exactly like E.T. in the movie. So there's a stick figure body, there's two long arms, there's very wide set eyes, and there's some feet down here. It's the most fun star cluster to show at uh, Outreach. Anyone who's seen the movie recognizes him. And if they haven't seen that, I found some of the kids uh, think it looks like the figure in WALL-E, the movie WALL-E, it looks like a little robot. Um, okay, to find Andromeda, I think we talked about this before, but this shows you a little bit closer. Again, here's Cassiopeia. You find the great square of Pegasus. You take the corner that can point to underneath the W and you find these two cascading sets of stars. Of stars. So I divided them into pairs. There's one pair here. This pair gets farther away and this pair gets even farther apart. Go back to the middle pair, go from the bottom to the next one, exact same distance, exact same direction. Uh, again, we're going toward Cassiopeia and you see the Andromeda galaxy. So that galaxy is the farthest you can see with your naked eye. In a dark sky, you will see a smudge. On a Greek sh um, cruise ship one year, when it was incredibly dark, I actually saw it as a glowing pencil in the sky. I've never seen it that way before or since, but I saw much more of its size than I've ever seen before uh, out in the middle of the ocean, the darkest part of the ship. It is actually um, five times as wide, in its entirety, five times as wide as a full moon. In a telescope, you generally cannot fit it entirely in your eyepiece. Uh, this picture would be taken uh, using a, an imager, not a, not a telescope eyepiece. Um, and normally in a small telescope, what you will see is the brighter nucleus as a smudge, and then you will see sort of fainter nebulosity. You almost need to wiggle your telescope to see the whole thing. If you move to the side, you'll also see these companion galaxies, which are similar to the Magellanic clouds and uh, around our galaxy, which we can see in the southern hemisphere. By the way, that is two million light years away, and it is the farthest you can see with your uh, naked eye. So we are seeing it two million years ago, and it's also coming toward us. Uh, and so it's part of a large uh, cluster of galaxies that we are part of, and it is um, in about seven billion years, I think, we will collide with it. We don't expect any of the stars to collide, but it would be quite a sight to see it coming at us uh, many years from now. However, unfortunately, I don't think the Earth will be around at that time. Um, another great object, which we haven't discussed yet, is a, is a um, oh, sorry, what we call a globular cluster. And let me see if I can find my mouse. Here it is. So now we're going on the opposite side of uh, Pegasus, which looks like a horse. Um, this great square is considered his wing. He's a flying horse. Here's uh, front legs. And um, here is what looks like a horse head. If you just kind of follow this crook and continue onward, you're going to run into M15. So this is a different kind of cluster from the open clusters. These are um, positioned not with our spiral arms of our galaxy, but above and below. And they are as old as the galaxy, we think. We believe they formed at the same time as the galaxy. The stars in them are mostly quite old. There's a few younger stars. And they're especially pretty to look at. Instead of looking at 120 stars, you're looking at more like tens of thousands of stars. 
Now, Perseus is another constellation in our story. Um, I forgot to tell the story. So the story is that um, the king and queen of, of uh, Ethiopia were asked to sacrifice their daughter Andromeda in order to launch their ships. Uh, the gods were creating all these big storms and they needed to appease the gods. So Andromeda was bound to a rock in the ocean, um, menaced by Cetus, the sea monster. Perseus was coming back from another uh, adventure, just having uh, decapitated the Gorgon, the, uh, the, the, um, which has the, the woman with the snake for hair, snakes for hair, and saw everything was happening here. He lands and volunteers to rescue Andromeda if he can marry her, which is a complication because she was supposed to marry somebody else. But, um, but Cassiopeia agreed to that. So he comes swooping down in some version of the story on Pegasus and rescues her. He's carrying the, um, which I will discuss in a minute, uh, the head of the Gorgon. He goes to her wedding party, turns all the guests to stones and, and uh, marries Andromeda. Um, one of the most interesting objects to see is actually between Perseus and Andromeda. Let's find my, my uh, there's my mouse. So Perseus's two cascading curves of stars that come to a point pointed at the left side of the W of Cassiopeia. Partway between, about a third of the way, a little bit offset, is a smudgy area, which is one of the few places, or maybe the only place I know of, that you can see two open clusters in one view in your telescope. So again, this is the same kind of clusters we've talked about before, but it's called the double cluster in Perseus, and it's a beautiful, striking view. You need a low power eyepiece to look at it. Uh, another major object is called M76. It's another planetary nebula. It's called the Little Dumbbell. Um, by the way, when you're researching these things and looking for images, do not just call them M76. I found out there's an awful lot of messy objects that are assault rifles. So you want to add something like M76 planetary nebula or M1 supernova. Um, so this is M76 image by one of our members, Val Ricks. And uh, a lot of these uh, planetary nebulas, that, which I mentioned explode, explode often in multiple lobes like this. It's called the little dumbbell because some people think it resembles a smaller version of, of uh, another um, summertime uh, planetary nebula called uh, the dumbbell M27, which is quite a bit larger. Now, per Perseus and Medusa, again, here they are in mythology. There is, that is also depicted in the sky and it's depicted by this star here called Algol. Algol in Arabic literally means the ghoul. And the reason they called that star the ghoul is that it's what we call a variable star, meaning it changes in brightness. This is one of the few that you can notice changing in brightness every two and a half days or so, naked eye. So sometimes it's brighter, sometimes it's fainter. And if you follow it for a while, you will see that it changes its brightness. So this was prominent enough for the ancients to actually notice that change in brightness. We believe that's why they chose that star to be called the demon star and to, rec to uh, represent the Gorgon. So here is an actual image of it or, or a time-lapse image of why it's variable. This is what we call an eclipsing variable. It's actually a double star system in which one of the stars every two and a half days passes in front of it and that causes its apparent uh, brightness to change over time. Here is the Gorgon in, uh, in the movies on the silver screen, how she's depicted. And I just wanna mention inside the story right now, you'll notice the planet Mars on your map if you download um, from www.skymaps.com near Cetus and Pisces. And it's not especially bright, but it's notable because we're gonna have some conjunctions with it coming up a little bit later. It's not especially bright in that we're not especially close to it in our orbit. And it's gonna be a smaller image right now in your telescope, but it's still worth a look. Uh, I did wanna end with this beautiful, um, this beautiful image of the recent conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter, which occurred on December 21st. This is the closest image I've seen that looks exactly like what I saw in my telescope. I was using an eight inch uh, F7 or an eight inch telescope uh, with a little bit longer focal length and, uh, and a wide field high powered eyepiece. 
and it was absolutely beautiful. We will not have another chance to see this view uh, for another uh, 80 years at least, and maybe not this close. But um, we have several more conjunctions of, of uh, planets in the same eyepiece coming up in 2021. So I decided that February would be a good time to talk about all the things that move in the sky. So conjunctions, eclipses, uh, occultations, we'll do a talk about that. And uh, that will be timely because the first of these conjunctions is coming up. Um, I believe it's between Venus and, uh, I can't remember, Venus and Jupiter, Venus and Mars. I will know by February, on February 11th, we have the first of these conjunctions and we have a couple more later in the year. So stay tuned um, we, for the February um, and we will get that done. So thank you very much. Any questions? Great job, Debbie. Thank you very much. Um, we did have a couple of questions that came in on the uh, chat here. Let me get to my document here. Uh, so Antonio, Antonio, do you want to come off mute and ask your question about uh, the asterisms? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation there. I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, concerning asterisms, is there any digital or analog source that you've come across in which the uh, useful asterisms are collected? Actually, I need to research that. I believe there are lists of asterisms. I'm gonna ask Joe if he knows the answer. Actually, I, uh, in the middle of the conversation, Steve Goldberg sent me a text and, uh, or a message I should say, and, and gave me a link to uh, a location online that has a number of good asterisms there. If I can share the screen here for just a moment, Debbie. Okay, yeah. And I'm gonna mention that we are still discovering them. We have a member, Bram Wiseman, who actually has had one officially accepted by the um, by the International Astronomical Union? Absolutely. So, do you guys see my screen by chance? The the website there. The and these are fun to look at because some of them are are telescopic and some of them are with binoculars. Absolutely. And uh, here, the deep skycouk slash asterisms.htm. So it looks like there's a, a pretty lengthy list here of uh, some of these asterisms and if you scroll through there are nice pictures of all the different asterisms what you can expect to see and, and whatnot the interesting thing i think the, the really neat thing about asterisms is uh sometimes you'll see an asterism that's got a, a neat name like you know the the dog or something like that and you look at it like i don't see a dog but i see something completely differently <laughs> so you know it, it's all up to the eye of the beholder and um you know as, as debbie had mentioned uh, we have a couple of members who are, are pretty adept at finding these patterns in the sky and submitting them for some sort of recognition. So um, they're out there. Anybody can and uh, you know locate these patterns and come up with a, a nice, neat name for them and, and get people to look at them. Yeah, and, and they're pretty striking. If you're sweeping your telescope across the sky, you don't often see something that really looks like a, a distinctive clump of stars that are that are that make a, a de definite shape. And sometimes you see some colors in those stars too. Absolutely. The other thing I was gonna mention here, Debbie, is uh, February 11th is Venus Jupiter. So uh, I was looking at this the other day. It looks like we're gonna have a number of conjunctions in 2021 uh, to, to take advantage of, but uh, the one on February 11th is uh, Venus and Jupiter. Right. Yeah, so 2021 is a great year for them. Absolutely. All right, uh, another question I saw was uh, Grant Evans. Grant, do you wanna come off mute and ask your question about the trapezium? Grant, are you there? If not, I'll go ahead and ask. Uh, Grant said he thought he'd read where there may be a black hole in the middle of the trapezium, is that correct? And I don't know yet, I'll have to, uh, I'll look it up, I'm not sure. So we, we certainly are finding black holes in general. Um, it would have to be, I, I have to look that up because these are normally very young stars, but, um, but very large stars could die out very fast. That's really curi a curiosity to me because we do think of black holes as being something that would happen at the end of, end of the lifetime of a star, of a very large star if it's a stellar black hole. So I'll, I'll, I'm, I wish I could answer that question. If anyone else knows the answer, please chime in. Absolutely. Thanks. And I believe those were all of the questions that we had in the chat. If anybody else wants to come off of mute here and ask a question of Debbie, feel free to do so. Hey, and Joe? Okay. Yes, Steve. Joe? Steve Goldberg here. Uh, going back to the asterisms, if you check the GuideStar newsletter every month, 
uh, there's an asterism of the month in there. And I've taken, I'm the author of that article, and I've taken some of them from this website. Uh, the Astronomical League has an observing program for asterisms. I've taken some off of there. Uh, the ones that look like their names is the ones I grab. The ones that don't, I pass on them. So that's another place to go. Um, right there. This month this is, is the umbrella. The umbrella, absolutely. So that's a great point, Steve. Thank you. So yeah, absolutely. Take a look at our website. We do have um, every month a, a list, as, as Stephen mentioned, of uh, you know asterism of the month that he puts together. We also have other objects there, but since we're on the topic of asterisms, uh, we can and, post and you that can go back to previous previous versions of the guide star and see different asterisms. Absolutely. All right. Uh, one more question. Are you there, Joe? Sure, certainly. It's uh, Mike Pepper here. Hey, Mike, how are uh, you? We're, we're, we're still here. <laughs> <laughs> 2021. What can I say? Um, Debbie, could you address just for a second what troubles you might have in the wintertime keeping your optics clear of condensation and such? Right. So, it, I mean, Houston, whether it's winter or summer, we have problems with dew. Um, so, uh, there are devices for heating. You just have to heat up your mirror or your um, or your corrector plate, whatever type of uh, whatever type of telescope you have. You need to keep the, the surfaces clear. And um, yeah, one thing we have the low tech way to do is with a hair dryer. One thing we do have at the at the astronomical site is power. I used to just take a hair dryer. Um, it's frustrating because you have to do it over and over again. Is it worse than that? So some people devise, um, you know, one, one of the talks I would love to do is how to make things. Some people devise dew heaters that you can make or you can buy one where people wrap, um, wrap things around their eyepieces and their mirror, which will keep it just warm enough to keep the dew from forming. The other thing is I did find, it was a relief when I bought a Newtonian telescope where the mirror is deep inside the tube. I have a lot less trouble with dew with that versus... Um, when I had a Schmidt cast where the corrector plate, I mean, I did have a dew, what we call a dew shield for that. So I wrapped uh, something foamy around that that's stuck out beyond it. That will delay the formation of dew. But the other problem is the eyepieces themselves. They get dewy also. So uh, sometimes you just have to use a hair dryer for that. And they say not overly hot. Um, and sometimes I just get impatient. I don't know if it's safe. Maybe someone better correct me. I do occasionally just bring some chamois and just kind of really gently wad it. But if someone needs to correct me and say, don't do that, <laughs> you know, please chime in. But when I get a little tired of, um, of the hairdryer constantly. Um, the, other, the other thing is I have found there are some climates where you just don't have to deal with that so badly. But uh, Houston's bad. It's also what makes us a lot colder. But we get too hot and too cold both because of the humidity. And we do have to deal with a lot of dew. Well, let me just so, tell you something somewhat unrelated. Of course, we're all looking at the bookshelves and wondering what that says about the people in the pictures and all the Zoom pictures on television. There are outfits that rent people sets of books to put in their shelves behind them to make the impression that they want. I was wondering about that. I mean, I can tell everyone has really styled their shelves. I have to read oh, yeah. it. Because I also do, uh, I have to moderate for the Houston Tuesday Musical Club. I've been doing that with all my astronomy toys back there. And I've got to, you know, I've got to sophisticate it up out there. This is actually my most playful room. I do have, uh, you know, more sophisticated artwork and more sophisticated shelves out front. This is where my computer is. But so, when you see this guy with, with all these biographies and all this heavy stuff behind him, yeah, he's not reading <laughs> right, right. Yeah, well, so I, I need to do like a fake version of me behind there, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do like a little bit of whimsy and, and uh, I've been, I do like space and astronomy. So this is the room that shows it. Thank you so much for tonight. Okay. That's great. That's oh, fine. thank you. Sorry, I'm a little, obviously a little bit tired from the last couple of days, but I hope it got out some. Yeah, well, yeah. Out okay. I must have been asleep for the last three days. Yeah. And you'll notice I have nothing behind me too. So that's so something. Um, <laughs> uh, any other questions? Hey, Joe, this is Bill Spazzeri. I hey, do Bill. not have a question, but if it's okay, please forgive me, Deborah. Uh, on the subject of asterisms, I have only one comment that's always in my head. And that is an asterism that a lot of people call the coat hanger. 
Okay, and there involves a straight line and a couple of stars underneath. And, and I was first showed that in the 1970s. And uh, the person who showed it to me said, yeah, people call this the coat hanger. He says, but I think it should be called a telescope. And, oh, there it is right there. So you see the telescope, the long horizontal line, and then the three stars underneath are the tripod. Okay, so obviously this is a personal thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you see what you <laughs> see. But uh, when he told me it, the telescope, and we're looking at stars through a telescope, I thought that was appropriate. So what do they call it here? Oh, they call it the coat hanger here. There you go. Yes. So uh, uh, that's just my two cents. Obviously, you can call it whatever you wanted, I guess. Thank this you, Deborah. Thank you. Yeah, this is in this is in Sigma, so it's more prominent in this, um, like a Texas star party is a great thing to look at. Um, it's very low. I'm, actually, I'm not sure which uh, latitude this uh, map is for, but it's more like New York or us. But it's quite low. It's actually probably above the horizon early in the evening, but it's very low for us. This is seen with uh, binoculars. It's too big for a telescope. Right, right. Yeah. And, and of course, yeah, it's in Cygnus, so it's basically uh, easier to see in the summer. And I was in Chicago, and that's the only time we took our telescopes out uh, was the summer, that's for sure. Awesome. Uh, any other questions for Debbie? So I would like to mention one thing. I mean, I've been doing this for four or five years. If there's some subject I failed to cover or something that I need to get back to more quickly, I'm open to suggestions. So um, please feel free to send any uh, subjects you'd like to see covered in these novice meetings. We appreciate that, Debbie. Thank you very much. And um, I guess if there are no additional questions, we'll go ahead and, and uh, wrap up for the evening. I did want to mention that uh, our general meeting is tomorrow, uh, general meetings tomorrow evening, and our uh, speaker is going to be Robin Jones. So Robin, I believe I saw, I did see him online earlier. I, I hope he's still on. But uh, for anybody interested in doing any kind of observing under light polluted skies or, or being able to, to, to really kind of get more out of the telescope, uh, electronically assisted astronomy is an area that is uh, gaining a lot of traction. A lot of people are interested in that. And Robin is going to share with us uh, some information about what EAA is, uh, how he got started in it, some of the tips, tools, techniques of, of what he does to get some of these images he gets. And when you take a look at uh, some of the, uh, just the pictures and whatnot that he's able to capture, they're absolutely fascinating. And uh, it's, it's amazing what you can do with uh, relatively cheap equipment and a short amount of time uh, capturing it. So that's gonna be tomorrow night at 7 p.m. If you haven't registered for that yet, go to our website, astronomyhouston.org and look for the registration links there. And if you are registered, just use the links that uh, Zoom sends you to join us tomorrow at seven. Um, as always, follow us on all of the social media uh, platforms, the major ones. And if you have any questions for us, you can always email us at info at astronomyhouston.org. So if there are no additional questions, uh, I'd like to thank you all again for joining us. And thank you again, Debbie, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, as often as I have observed the night sky, I learn something every time you do these presentations. So thank you again. I will, ha I will have one question for Robin tomor tomorrow. He might want to, uh, to uh, research. I, I actually, my family is originally from Oklahoma. I want to know how the Rosette Nebula became your official state nebula. Absolutely. So, <laughs> yeah, good question. Absolutely. Uh, I'm not sure. I'll have to check that out. So it, it is a very beautiful nebula. So it is. We'll do a little bit of research before tomorrow's uh, presentation. So we'll take a look at that. All right, everybody. Well, again, thank you very much for joining us. I hope uh, you're all doing well. Stay safe and we'll see you tomorrow. Have a good night. Thanks, everybody.